还没拿到发票的话，待会可以到报道处右手边的资讯服务，呃，服务台领取你的发票。OK， 那第二个就是地上蛮多电线跟网路线，请大家走路的时候要小心，不要被绊倒了。好，那最后一个就是这一场，呃 k i n o 是由 AWS Amazon Web Service 赞助的，那你们大家手上的橘色的小猫袋里面。都有一张 AWS 的问卷，那如果各位把它填写完之后，一样找到报道处右手边的那个服务台，大家可以换到五十块美金的 AWS 的 c o u p o n 谢谢 AWS。啊，那待会的第一个是马库，马库会用英文进行，所以我先简单介绍一下。这个呃，这个 session， 那我自己是在传统产业工作，在在五六年前我参加 Cost Cup， 然后我本身是一个半导体的工程师，但我很喜欢 Open Source。参加了参加了 Cost Cup 之后呢，就更喜欢 Open Source， 所以就开始参参与很多 Open Source 的活动，还有方面的。那在这几年期间，呃，云端运算啊，还有 big data， 开始成为越来越多的话题。那刚好 ，AWS 在这几年间，在从零三零五年开始，做了很多 S3、EC2 的呃工作，让大家更方便有 API， 更方便的做这些云端的呃部署跟配置。所以今天很荣幸可以请到 AWS 的马库。马库他是 AWS 亚太区的呃 technology e v e n t u a l i s t 那他本身在 IT 产业有大约十四年、十五年的工作经验。他以前就是在做关于 IT、IMD， 然后他也做过呃一些 technology 的 architecture。那他之前服务在那个 Nokia、Siemens、Network。Network 的一个部门，那负责全球的 business 的呃 unit 部署，所以他对 architecture 还有 technology 的 transformation 非常的熟悉。那待会马库会跟我们介绍以及分享关于如何把 open data， 如何把呃 open data 跟 big data， 以及一些 open source 的工具把它结合在一起。所以我们现在就来热呃热烈掌声欢迎马库。谢谢你，呃，你问好，认识你，认识你们，我很高兴。那我现在被，那我现在是 streaming， 所以 otherwise this is a very short presentation <笑>。So let's get going. Can I please have the slides on the project? So today, because this is an open source conference, we are really happy to be here from Amazon Web Services. And I would like to show you today how open source engines can be powering big data analytics in the cloud. And my, my name is Marko Lepisto, I'm from Finland, and I'm a technology evangelist for Amazon Web Services. And before we get started, I would just like to show you a few of our customers from the Great China area. So some of these may be familiar to you here. We are really excited to have these companies and more as our customers here in this, in this region. Okay, let's talk about big data now. The first question is, what is big data? Well, we as a society are producing more and more data. So earlier today, you have heard about open data, using open data. This is all related to the same. There is just more and more data all the time. When you take a picture, when you take a video, when you go to Facebook, when you use Taobao, whatever, you are constantly producing more data. And it's not just people, it's not just us humans. Now, more and more devices are connected to the internet. It's called machine to machine or internet of things. You have sensors. We have customers like Shell, which is an oil company. They have a lot of sensors all around them that they are analyzing that for their business benefit. So one definition of big data is that the data is big when it's so big that you need to innovate as a business. You need to innovate in order to collect, store, 
organize, analyze, and share your data. What does it mean, innovate? It means that the legacy systems, the old systems, like your relational databases and your storage arrays, they are not good enough anymore. They cannot handle this big data. And sometimes big data is categorized by these three Vs. What are the three Vs? Volume, velocity, and variety. So volume means how much data. There is just more data now and every year than ever before. Velocity means faster than before. Data is coming in at a really, really fast rate. And you as a business, if you use data like you should for your business, the faster you use the data, the better. So data has to be fresh. That means real-time or near real-time analytics based on your use cases. And then variety means that data is more and more unstructured. It's not enough anymore to have one database with one couple of tables, that's it. There is so much data coming in from Twitter, from Facebook, from all these social sites, from your videos, whatever, that is unstructured. And also the role of data itself is changing. It used to be that you defined where data has to be. Because you made the database, you made the tables in the database, you made the schema, and then you had to force your data into that schema. That was the old world. Now in the new world, the funny thing is that one definition of big data is it's cheaper to just store the data than figure out what data you need. So let's say you have all the data from your business. If you spend time planning and thinking, do I need this part of the data, do I need that part of the data, that costs you maybe more time, time is also money, than just storing all of it. Because storage systems are, disks are so cheap nowadays. So just store all of it first. That's one recommendation we give, especially to startups and also enterprises. Store all of your data, and then maybe you can discover new value in the data. Because data is now the new oil. Some people say data is the new oil. Data has value, just like capital, so money and people, your labor. Data is a new capital. But there's a problem. There's a huge gap between storing the data, having the data, which is the raw material, and turning that into actionable information for your business. And the gap is getting bigger. Here on the bottom you can see the blue line, how much data is available for analysis, so data that is usable. And the orange line is how much data we are producing as a society. All the time the gap is getting bigger. And this is one indication of that. We, Amazon Web Services, one of our first services was S3, our simple storage service. The mission for the S3 is to be the storage for the internet. That's a simple mission statement for Amazon S3. And last year, we were really happy and excited to announce that our S3 storage system or service was storing one trillion objects. That was last year. We launched the service in 2006. So it took about six years for S3 to collect one trillion objects. Now it's over two trillion objects. So first trillion was six years, then we doubled that in less than a year. So the space of data storage is accelerating. And it's regularly beating at over 1.1 million requests per second. This is just one example of how data is exploding. Now, you may have a business then. You may have a web-based business where you sell something, and you may ask this question, so this is a business problem. What are my top products? And specifically, what were my top products last year during lunch hour? I don't know why, maybe this is a business decision that you have to make. So you as developers, you are thinking, well, it's easy, let's just do this. Let's do a select statement to my database and query the products from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and then we sort them and grab them and cut them and sort them again, right? Just press enter. No, stop there. <laughs> Let's think about it a little bit. You might have one petabyte of data. It's not unheard of. Some businesses may have petabytes of log data, for example. In a normal storage system and processing system, if you have a single system, Let's say it can handle 50 megabytes per second. 
So you can read through your data and solve it and grab in 50 megabytes per second. That's quite a normal speed. It would take 231 days to execute that one command with one petabyte of data. No, we need something else. We need massively parallel processing. <laughs> so this is an example of massively parallel processing, but it uses the same principle. So you cut the bit job into parallel processing pipelines. You don't serialize. You parallelize. Now, let's do that with IT. Those were people, they use the same principle. Let's look at open source tools that can help you do big data analytics. The first one is the elephant, the friendly yellow little elephant called Hadoop. <laughs> Hadoop was actually the name of the toy of the person who invented the Hadoop software. It was his daughter's toy, if I remember. <laughs> Hadoop gives us two things. So Hadoop is not the only big data tool, but it's one of the best kind of core utilities in big data analytics. And it gives us two tools, HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System, which is a really cheap way and scalable way of storing data reliably across commodity hard drives. So you, you don't need expensive storage systems, any disks will do, and it scales out horizontally. And it's reliable, so if you lose any of the disks, then your data is still there. It's replicated and copied again. The second part is MapReduce. MapReduce is a processing algorithm. It's just an idea of splitting a job into small jobs, handling it, and then collecting the results again. So MapReduce is a processing algorithm. So Hadoop just gives us those two things. Reliable distributed storage and massively parallel analytics. Now, how does it work? Let's take a, take a look at the example again. We have a huge log file. This log file has data. It's our raw data. It has information. We want to know, let's say there's a user, John. What has John done? What is John's experience in my website? Well, using Hadoop, we could first split this huge file, because one computer cannot handle it, into many, many small pieces. We use Hadoop to process these small pieces. And then we collect the results again and we get the history of what John has done on your website. How does it actually work? Let's take a look at MapReduce. If you, are not, if you have not used MapReduce, this is trying to be a simple explanation. So on the left is the input file. One part of the file given to this node. So this is one worker node in Hadoop. So it gets an input file and then it gets the job, the map process. The map process is something that you write, so it's a job. It's something like count the number of things that John has done, or count the number of actions per user, John and Mary and Bob and Frank, whatever. And then you collect the results back and you aggregate, and then you get the output. But the idea with Hadoop is that you have more nodes. Hadoop with one node would be very silly. It wouldn't be any better than the legacy version. So you add more nodes, they have more files. Everyone has their own little file, chunk of the total file. Everybody does analytics on their file, and then they collect the results. So this green could be the results for John, yellow could be Mary, and red could be Bob. So they collect the results. This guy is counting for John, this guy is counting, this guy is counting, and they collect the results together. That's massively parallel processing using MapReduce. And then, when you do this, first of all, you can process the file a lot faster than 231 days, and then you get the actionable insights, what you can do use in your business. How can we help John? Maybe John is lost on the website. Maybe we can help him find the information he's looking for, and that is driving business plus. That's all nice, but there's another problem. It's not so easy to do hard. There are a couple of problems. So Hadoop is just software, right? In, if you want to run Hadoop in your data center, you need to buy hardware first. How many? You don't know, because you have masses of data coming in. You don't know how much. You don't know how it's going to change. You don't know what you want to do with the data. 
how many processing nodes you need for Maru. You don't know. And then you need to put them together, you need to do the cabling. This was me many, many years. I was doing that in the data center, so <laughs> <laughs> I know that very, very well. It's a bit painful. So doing Hadoop in the legacy way is a bit hard. And you spend a lot of time doing this infrastructure part, which is just necessary evil, but that's not what you want to do. You want to use Hadoop to get analytics results. That's why we think that big data loves the cloud. Big data and cloud computing is a marriage made in heaven. Why? First we have to figure out what exactly is cloud computing. So we at Amazon Web Services, we define cloud computing with a couple of simple principles. Some of them are here. Now, elastic means that instead of having 10 servers doing Hadoop, for example, you don't know. Sometimes you need three, sometimes you need 3,000. So you need to be able to scale your system up and down or out and in, horizontally scaling, based on your needs right now. So let's take a look at the scalability. This is an example from Amazon.com, which is the website, the web business, the retail business. This is their November traffic. You can see that most of the days are pretty similar. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Something is happening at the end of November. In the United States, there are two days in November when people go crazy with shopping. One is called Black Friday, and one is called Cyber Monday. I don't know why, but that's what they are. <laughs> they are just very popular with shopping. Now, with the legacy systems, if Amazon.com would be using physical servers, which they don't do anymore, they would have to buy this much capacity, the blue line there, because they have to survive the peak load. If they don't have enough capacity, on those two days, the system would be really, really bad experience for the users. If they buy so much capacity, look what happens. 76% of your capital ex expenditure, your investments, would be wasted. Because you would have to invest in those servers, 76% of the time they are not doing enough. Only 34% of the time they would be doing actual business. So the return on investment would be very bad. But that's not the case anymore, because for some time already, Amazon.com Amazon has been running on Amazon Web Services Cloud. They don't need to do capacity planning anymore, because they just scale up and down the system automatically based on the incoming traffic. Now, you may or may not know how much traffic your system will have. These are some of the examples of usage patterns. So big data analytics is a good example of the first one, on and off. You run some heavy analytics job, maybe using Hadoop, but then you switch it off. Maybe you run it once an hour, once a day, once per month. Then many websites experience the second one, fast growth. You make a really funky service, nice service, people are using it, Facebook, Weibo, Alba, whatever, people are happy about it, start using it, and it goes through the roof. Some websites have variable peaks you really don't know. Some systems have predictable, steady traffic. With the normal capacity provisioning, with the normal way of buying hardware, you have these problems, same as Amazon.com. You either have too much capacity, which is wasted, or you don't have enough capacity, which is even worse, and your customers get a bad experience. Then, you, then they leave your service, they go somewhere else. So cloud computing, the elasticity, can help in all of these cases by automatically auto-scaling your system, provisioning just the right amount of resources when you need them and when you don't need them anymore. At night time, for example, you release the resources and then you pay less. So you're right-sizing your environments. So, Remembering the problems with big data and some of the benefits of cloud computing, I would now like to introduce to you Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Now what is that? What is Amazon Elastic MapReduce or EMR for short? Well, it's basically Hadoop in the cloud. Or let's say more accurately, the Hadoop ecosystem of open source tools in the cloud. This is one picture, it's a bit fuzzy, you may not be able to see, I can explain. So, 
the, in short, Amazon Elastic MapReduce lets you run big data analytics in the cloud, getting all the benefits of cloud computing and using the absolutely normal Hadoop ecosystem tools. And it's a fully hosted managed service. So the idea is that you don't have to manage Hadoop anymore. You don't have to install Hadoop, configure Hadoop, keep it alive, patch it, and especially you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure like the servers. You just use the Hadoop. When you need it, when you don't need it, you switch it off and you stop paying. In short, it works like this. We have our simple storage service, the storage for the internet. You put your input, input data there, then you spin up an EMR cluster, which is running Hadoop and other Hadoop products and tools on EC2, on our cloud instances, the virtual machines. There are thousands of customers already using Amazon Elastic MapReduce. You can see some of them here, and you can see that they are from different businesses. So we have Netflix, IMDB, Yelp, Samsung, Foursquare. A lot of businesses are using Elastic MapReduce because it's giving them the benefits of cloud for Hadoop analytics. And here you can see some use case examples. So Hadoop is not just for one, it's not just for gaming, it's not just for websites. People are doing DNA analysis. Banks are doing Monte Carlo and risk analysis simulations. Security companies are analyzing, analyzing massive amounts of data for threats, for viruses, for image recognition, etc. Anything that needs massively parallel processing can benefit from Hadoop and can benefit from Amazon Elastic Records. So far, our customers have launched over 5.5 million clusters in the Amazon Cloud, AWS Cloud, since we launched the service in 2010. So, what is EMR Hadoop? It's the normal Hadoop. It's not a funny Hadoop, it's not a weird Hadoop, it's the absolutely normal Hadoop. We have different versions of Hadoop that you can run, and once there's a new version available, we will configure it, package it, make sure it's stable, and then we will release the new version, and you can start using it. So we are optimizing Hadoop to run on the cloud. You can choose from the normal open source Apache Hadoop distribution, which is the community code. And by the way, Amazon Web Services is contributing back. So whatever optimizations we do for Hadoop, we contribute those back to the Apache Foundation code upstream. You can also choose from two different Map R versions, which are more enterprise versions of Hadoop. They have ODPC support. They have name node protection, high availability, for example. So you can choose. You have it's flexible and you have the choice. You make the choice. The point about Elastic MapReduce is that it can execute job flows. So job flow is what you tell Hadoop and the other tools to do in EMR. So you write the job flows. You can either make a Java jar file, that's the first option, make a jar file. You can use cascading, or you can use streaming Hadoop using these different programming languages. The idea is that you make a job flow that tells Hadoop what to do. So you write the map processes and the reduce processes, and you point the EMR cluster to the source data in S3. Then this EMR cluster will stream, parallel stream the data from S3, into the Hadoop cluster nodes. The Hadoop nodes are then executing the MapReduce jobs. That's the job flow. And the results are written back to S3. Or you have another option. You can use the HDFS file system in that Hadoop cluster. So with EMR, Elastic MapReduce, basically you have two types of Hadoop clusters. You have kind of on-off clusters. So you run the job, you put the results back in S3 and you remove the cluster. Or some people leave it running. They have permanent clusters. And with permanent clusters, you can then utilize the HDFS file system there. So it's up to you. And it's not just Hadoop. So we have prepackaged and tested and configured the popular tools that go together with Hadoop, like Hive. Hive is a nice way of getting a data warehouse for your Hadoop system. 
it gives you like an SQL interface how you can access Hadoop and run the MapReduce jobs. So you are writing SQL, and actually it's called HiveQL. It's a little version of SQL, it's a smaller version, a subset of SQL. But you can have an SQL-like interface into MapReduce. Some people don't like writing MapReduce because it's a little bit difficult. So Hive gives you a more familiar SQL style access into your data and to run MapReduce. So when you write the HiveQL commands, Hive is going to execute MapReduce in the background in Hadoop. The other option is PIC, which is similar to Hive. There's a funny language that they have made, it's called PIC Latin, which is also SQL-like. PIC is very good for extract, transform, and load. It's very good for loading data into Hadoop and transforming. Let's say from very unstructured, you need to clean up the data. It's very good for that. It's also query language. Then, you can also choose, when you spin up the EMR cluster, to have it run HSpace. HSpace is a columnar NoSQL database. It's a key value store, and it's near real time. And it's tightly integrated to the HDFS file system and Hadoop. So if you want, you can use HSpace. It's just an option. Click, I want HSpace. That's it. You don't have to figure out how to install HSpace. You just say, can I have HSpace, please? Click, bang, it's there. Then, if you want to monitor the system with Ganglia, if you are familiar with that, most people probably are, that's just another option. You just say, I would like, when I now spin up this Hadoop cluster in the cloud, can I please have Ganglia? Yes, sir. It's there. So it's prepackaged. So you can, with Ganglia, you can monitor both your cluster, Hadoop cluster, and the individual nodes. And then there are more specialized tools, like Mahout and R. Mahout is a machine learning library, and R is a statistical programming language. And this is now beyond my competence already. <laughs> These tools are very specialized. They are typically used for discovering value in the data. And they are typically used by guys or ladies who are called data scientists. Now look at this. This is just a tip. It's a free tip. Uh, you may want to consider a career as a data scientist. Look at the demand in the industry. Data scientist is one of the hottest jobs in the IT industry today. They are the people who define the data strategy for business. And remember, more and more, data strategy is what's driving the business. So these people, they find the data value. And they usually use tools like visualization to show the data value to managers. They need to sell the idea to managers, right? They are very good at this, discovering the unknown unknowns. What is an unknown unknown? Data has some value, you have no idea it's there. So here, some data scientist has discovered a correlation, a relationship between the number of tweets about the price of rice and the food inflation. Look, there's a nice correlation. They found this out probably using R and Mahout and maybe Hadoop as well. And they do visualization. This is an example of D3. D3 is a really nice open source visualization library. It's very easy to integrate that into your application to make really beautiful graphics that are not static, they are kind of alive. You can touch them and modify them. Really cool. So take a look at D3. Then, one of the benefits of cloud computing is, which we consider maybe the main one, you can focus on your business. Focus on what differentiates your application from the rest. We call it abstracting away or outsourcing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So here we have an example of a business. This is you. So this is you in the red delivery van there. You just want to zoom around the city, delivering your stuff to your customers. That's your business. You don't have to worry, you don't want to worry about who builds the roads. You don't want to build the infrastructure. You don't want to especially own the huge machinery. This is real, this is not 
CGI effects. <laughs> this is a machine in Germany. There's only one of them. So you don't especially want to own the infrastructure. You want to use the infrastructure. So focus on your business. So with the Amazon Web Services Cloud, you can offload the infrastructure to us. We handle the heavy lifting, and you can focus on your application development. Focus your resources and time on what makes business difference. That's your coding. Okay, how easy is it? How easy is it to use Hadoop in Amazon Cloud, Amazon Web Services Cloud? Well, you have three ways. You can use the console. This is the web console. You can just say create a new Elastic MapReduce cluster with a job code. Here are the three basic steps. You upload your data to S3, you create a job flow, and then Hadoop is executing, and then you get the results from S3. You can choose from the different distributions, different versions of Hadoop, whether it's the Apache one or the Mac R, what version. You can either run your own application, as an interactive application. So for example, you can say, I want Hive, and then you run Hive commands by hand. But the recommended way, the better way, is then to package your job, whether you use Java or Cascading or Hive or Bit, package your scripts and application, just tell the EMR cluster to launch your application when it's starting. You can also use the command line, which is what I prefer. And here's an example. The command is easy, Elastic MapReduce, create a cluster on, in Europe, for example. Give it some name. How many instances of Hadoop? Hadoop knows you want. How big are the virtual machines, the instances? And then keep it alive. So this one will not be removed when the job is over. This is a permanent cluster until you shut it down. The other option is that it executes the job flow and automatically goes away when the job is done. Then, if you want to use Hive or Big or HBase, for example, or Ganglia, you can just have, have them displayed here as options when you execute the command. Now, that's good. I mentioned earlier that Big Data loves the cloud. Let's see how Hadoop Elastic MapReduce can benefit from the elasticity and on-demand aspects of the cloud. This is a really funny mathematical equation using cloud computing. It costs you the same to run one instance to one virtual server for 1,000 hours as running 1,000 virtual machines for one hour. The second one is much better for Hadoop and analytics because it's massively parallel. You don't want to wait 1,000 hours. The cost is the same. So the little elephant really likes this. I can scale. What does it look like? Well, basically, using cloud computing, you can start off with one instance, or maybe three. Maybe three is minimum with Hadoop. You can scale it to a thousand, or several thousand instances. When you need more horsepower, you want the job to finish faster. And to save cost, you can scale it back to one or zero. And when you scale your system down to zero, you stop paying for it. So here, think of a shower. When you take a shower in the morning or in the evening, you don't leave the water running when you go to bed. That would be very stupid, right? Cloud computing is utility computing. It's the same as electricity. It's the same as water. You turn it on when you need it. Then you pay a little bit for the utility cost. You turn it off when you don't need it. And you stop paying for it. That's cloud computing. It's, a, it's utility computing. So pay as you go. Here we have some analysis showing that customers, businesses can save tremendous amount of money using cloud computing compared to owning and building data centers and capex. One example is our customer Foursquare who uses Elastic MapReduce they have reported a 50% reduction in their analytics costs. One really funny way of, of doing cost optimization in Amazon a Web Services Cloud is using spot instances. The normal instances, if you will, are called on-demand. 
There's another type of instances called reserved instances, which are a lot cheaper if you know you need these instances for a long period of time. So you should really optimize your cost. But the third one is called spot instances. It's a little bit like the stock market for virtual machines. So basically, we have unused capacity in the Amazon Web Services Club. And using spot instances, you can bid. You can say, hmm, now I would like to pay maybe 20 cents for my virtual machines. And if the stock market price of virtual machines is lower than that, then you can run those virtual machines with that price. If the kind of stock market price goes higher than what you're willing to pay, then you don't run those spot instances. Here's a kind of distribution. What people are bidding compared to the on-demand price. So 100% means that people are bidding 100% of the price for spot instances compared to on-demand. On-demand is the normal price, the standard price. So a lot of people are using spot instances and they are paying the same as for on-demand. Then you're wondering why. Because most of the time, a lot of the time, the spot price is cheaper than on-demand. So some people are using spot instances and paying, bidding a lot less than the on-demand price. But some people are actually bidding more. So if you look at the blue line here, some people are bidding 200% of the price. Now you're wondering, why would they want to pay two times the money compared to on-demand? That's crazy. Because most of the time, when you look at it over time, the spot instance price is cheaper than on-demand. Maybe sometimes it will peak up. But in the long term, they end up paying less anyway. So you should do cost optimization. We have a tool called uh, we have a tool in the Amazon Web Services GUI called Trusted Advisor. Using Trusted Advisor, you can analyze your environment. And we give you cost-saving tips. And a lot of our customers are paying less. So Amazon Web Services is a strange company from that point of view that we call our customers and tell them, hey, you should optimize your environment like this and pay less. They're usually very surprised when we let them know. Okay, so how spot prices work with Elastic MapReduce? Now, here on the left, we have an example of running Elastic MapReduce with four virtual machines, four instances. Let's say that with your data, this job takes 14 hours. And the price you pay is four instances times 14 hours times 50 cents per hour. That's just an example. There are different prices in different regions, different virtual machine instance sizes, have different prices. That's just an example, $28. Now let's take a look with spot instances. So with four virtual machines, it takes 14 hours. But if we add five spot instances, now we have nine virtual machines. There's more horsepower, there's more parallelism. Now the job will finish in seven hours, half the time, because you added more horsepower. What about the price? Well, now we are running these on-demand instances, the normal ones, the yellow ones, for seven hours. The four times seven times the same price for those instances is fourteen dollars. Plus, we need to calculate the spot instance prices. Spot instances, we have five of them. We also, they also run seven hours, but they are significantly cheaper. This is just an estimation, so it's an average fifty percent price of the normal price. It fluctuates. But it's a safe bet to say that, on average, it's cheaper. They are cheaper to run. So 14 plus 8 is just over $22. So by using spot instances, procuring more resources, you reduce your time in half, and you reduce your cost as well by 22% in this example. And this is weird mathematics. You use more resources, you are faster, and you pay less. And then this might happen. <laughs> Sometimes Hadoop can go a little bit crazy. If you use spot instances and the spot market price goes above what you're willing to pay, we will remove that instance. That will be terrible if that's your SQL database, so don't do that. But Hadoop is a good example where you can use spot instances because if the market price goes higher than you're willing to pay, 
virimuhtas potinstans hadu pa XTFS, can survive that. If you lose a task node in hadu or XTFS node, it's fine. Hadu or software level can survive that loss of a, or loss of a node. We put it back or you put it back, you don't lose your data. The only thing would be that if you lose your master node, the Hadu task master, then your job flow would fail. There is an option that you can use then the map R distribution, which has redundancy for the name for the master node, the name node. Okay, let's take a look at customer use cases. The first one, one of our customers, AWS customer using Elastic Map Reduces Netflix, their business question is what kind of movies and TV shows people like to watch? They have tens of millions of users, and look at that, 50 billion events in a day. So they are recording and handling 50 billion events in a day. They do it like this. They are streaming over 10 terabytes of data per day from their devices, from their customers, through Chuck Wap tool into the stream, Amazon S3. And they have also legacy systems in their data center, which are also uploading data to S3. And they use Cassandra, a NoSQL key value store that they run across multiple availability zones and regions in AWS Cloud. That has the kind of ongoing customer transactions. Those are exported via iDiscus, I can't pronounce it, the Greek guard or something. It's a tool that they wrote, they export the Cassandra data into S3 as well. Why S3? So let's get to that. So Netflix stores around one petabyte of data in the Amazon S3. How do they use it? Why do they put it there? Well, they use Amazon Elastic Map Reduce, their production clusters, but also they have testing and discovery clusters. So using Elastic Map Reduce, they stream the data that they want to analyze from S3 in parallel into Amazon Elastic Map Reduce, execute Hadoop, they use these different programming languages to work on the data. Then the results are written back to S3 and they use these results in their recommendation engine to do ad hoc analysis and also personalize the website. Not only that, S3 is the single source of truth for data at Netflix. So they have their production cluster running really critical tasks that need to finish by let's say 5 in the morning. They don't want to disturb the production cluster if they want to do discovery on the data. Figure out some new things, innovate. That's why they spin up another cluster and another cluster. This developer wants his own one and this developer wants her own Hadoop cluster. They all point it to the same master data in S3 without disturbing the production cluster. So Netflix is spinning up and spinning down and removing multiple Hadoop clusters with EMR every day. They have even built what they call Hadoop platform as a service architecture. So this is their stack. On the bottom is Amazon S3 with all the data. That's their data warehouse. They run EMR clusters. They interact with the clusters with different programming languages. They have written their own genie, which is managing the job execution. Do we start a new EMR cluster? Do we utilize an existing EMR cluster? Do we use spot instances, reserve instances for price optimization? Do I have time left in this Hadoop cluster that's running for one hour to maybe run one more job without paying more money. So they have a workflow manager gene. Why S3? There are a couple of reasons why Netflix chose that. First of all, Amazon S3 has 11 nines of durability. So 99.9999999999 99 durability. How much is that in real life? If you store 10,000 objects, for example, here, it will take tens of millions of years to lose even one. So the probability of losing data with 11 nines of durability is mathematically almost impossible. It's because we replicate and distribute the content across multiple devices, multiple availability zones. 
so it's extremely durable. Also, you can press Ctrl Z. So if you just use HTFS, that's fine. But you might have a business process, you might make a bug in your code that destroys your data. You might accidentally delete the data manually. And then, uh oh, but because Netflix stores the data in S3, S3 supports versioning. They can just roll back to a previous version of the data. They don't lose anything. Then, one of the main use cases is the recommendation engine. You cannot really read it from there, I think, but Netflix has stated that 75% of their traffic, user transactions, are coming based on recommendations. So the fact that they do big data analytics, they get recommendations. Hey, you like that movie, maybe you will like also these movies that are similar. That is driving 75% of their business. So it's very significant for Netflix. It's their main asset. Let's quickly take a look at Foursquare. They also a global service with tens of millions of users and a lot of businesses using them. They generate terabytes of log data from billions of check-ins. People check into a venue. Today I'm here at this Costco event. Maybe I use Foursquare to check in. Millions of venues. They also do big data analytics. They use EMR for evaluating new features, machine learning, reporting, trend analysis for different use cases. According to Foursquare, they like, they like Amazon Elastic MapReduce because it's easy to use, it's flexible, and it saves them a lot of costs. How do they use it? This is their stack. I will explain it if you cannot see it there. So they have their application layer here. They use Scala for their application. As databases, data storage, they use MongoDB, Postgres, and flat files. From those data sources, they do database dumps, and they use Apache Plume to stream the log files into S3, Amazon S3. So from database dumps and Apache Plume for log files into S3. And then they execute Elastic MapReduce clusters and run Hadoop jobs on this data. And they have Hive and Ruby and Mahout as those tools that they use to discover and work with the data. And they have an analytics dashboard. Why do they do this? They know, for example, based on their clip data and event data, who is a little bit more men than women, typically between 20 and 40 years of, of age. And look at this. This is a comparison in one week of three different venues. The orange one is a cafe, so people go to the cafes in the mornings. Blue one is a restaurant, so they go eat lunchtime, maybe dinner. And the kind of green one is a bar. So people go to the bar for drinks in the evenings, especially on Sundays in this city. And this is a geographical representation of their user signups over time using Amazon Elastic MapReduce. You can see that all over the world, pretty much, people are using Foursquare. And here is Taiwan. Let's take a look again. Taiwan is there. <laughs> yes, people are using Foursquare in Taiwan. Okay, Yelp, another customer example. They want to know who is using their search. They want to find the signal in the noise of raw data. One use case is that when people use Yelp, so what, what is Yelp? I use Yelp quite a lot when I travel a lot. So I go to a city I have not been before. I want to know where is a nice restaurant for now lunch, for example, some for nice beef noodles or, oh, my suit is bad, I need dry cleaning. So where do I go? What is a good dry cleaning place? Yelp can help people find those. But people make mistakes. So here people type West End when they actually want West End, the hotel. So, Yelp uses Elastic MapReduce to figure out common typos, common mistakes, what people actually meant. And then they can help people discover what they really wanted to find. Also recommendations. And look at this, again, mapping data. This is an example that I did myself using their engineering tools. I selected noodles and San Francisco, this is the city. So where in San Francisco are venues and reviews that contain the word noodle. So in these areas of San Francisco, there are probably 
telling me it's restaurant. <laughs> so this is interesting. It's again using Elastic Map Reduce. They have written an open source library for Python called Mr. Job. And here, this is Mr. Job. It's very cute. It's on GitHub if you want to take a look. They wrote Mr. Job to work with Amazon Elastic Map Reduce. They use Mr. Job library to spin up hundreds of Hadoop clusters that process a lot of data every day. And because it's easy to use flexible and cost efficient, any Yelp developer can just do this. They point Amazon Elastic Map Reduce to their source data and spin up a cluster to analyze it up and down every day. If you want to start practicing with Hadoop and Elastic Map Reduce, we have what we call public data sets freely available in the AWS cloud. They contain, for example, web crawls of billions of websites, DNAs of people, I think, <laughs> maybe animals, population, census data, and many other data sets. They are here, AWS, Amazon, com, public data sets. These are really cool to start practicing Hadoop because you need some source data. It's not just practicing. A company, a customer of ours called Iron Flux, is using this public data set for genomes to do DNA sequencing for health professionals. Hopefully something like finding cures for diseases. So that's really nice. They run hundreds of these EMR clusters every day. The Climate Corporation is doing similar things. They run EMR clusters in AWS. And look at their source data. 60 years of crop data. 14 terabytes of soil data, radar points. They do weather predictions for farmers. 150 billion soil observations stored in S3. And then rainfall and weather measurements, etc. So they do big data analytics for weather. If you want to learn more about Amazon Elastic MapReduce, on our website you have videos, documentation, API reference, getting started guys, frequently asked questions, etc. So, to finish off, Amazon Elastic Map Reduce. It's elastic and scalable, no upfront capex, you don't need to buy servers and storage systems. You pay for use, you pay exactly how much you use it, when you stop using it you don't pay anything, and it's on demand. When you need a Hadoop cluster, bang, it's available now. So it's removing constraints. When you remove constraints, you allow more experimentation. And with more experimentation, you get innovation. Innovation and experimentation are tied to you. If people can't try things, they don't just try anything new. When you let them innovate new things and try things, they discover value your new business features. So the point about big data, open source tools and cloud is that you should focus on your business, what is differentiating for your business, your product features, your applications, and leave the infrastructure management, the low level heavy lifting, for example, to Amazon Web Services. Because you don't want to be this guy. <laughs> you really don't want to be. This was also me many years ago. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Maku, and present that uh, it's really our honor to have AWS and uh, Maku here to present us how the big data and uh, open source tools and uh, cloud computing they complement each other and uh, work together in harmony. So. We bring some gifts. Can we turn on the light? Thank you. It's a local gift from Haku. And this is a special bag. It's called Cup Bag, especially for speakers. Thank you, Haku. And Haku will have another.